Hey guys, I'd like to welcome you to another episode of the Acoustic Silk Show. We are here with a very, very special guest. Aiden Lewis is in the building. Hello. Have you been, Hello. Aiden? How's, how's everything been going? It's actually been a long time since we've actually spoken, since the last... It's been week. a very long time. It's like two years now. Almost two years, man. I actually wrote down yeah. the date here. I got June 20th, 2016 was the time we, we had the last one. Yeah, it's been a while. It's been a while. I've been good, though. It's been a it's been a very um, prosperous and hectic uh, year and a half, I would say. <laughs> yeah, a lot of growth, a lot of change, a lot of oh yeah, different definitely. things you've for been sure. working on. Um, yeah, definitely for sure. Yeah, so I I know that you you're still in LA, right? I am still in LA. Yep. But I actually um I recent so I I think the last time we talked I lived in Palmdale, which was like an hour out of LA. But um I'm actually officially in LA now. I'm in uh, Van Nuys, so. I'm like actually officially an LA resident now. Okay. Now take us through why you wanted to move. I mean, I guess obviously there's probably more things to do in, in actually in LA and probably closer to your work and in whatever you do on the daily. Um, so was that the main reason why? Yeah, that's mainly it. Like, honestly, it's just, um, you know, no offense to anybody that's from Palmdale or who loves Palmdale, but you know, there's not too, too much to do in Palmdale and, uh, Again, it's like an hour out and, um, you know, when I'm doing sessions and stuff, it's hard to um, do something like really quick or impromptu when you live an hour away. Right. And you have to like plan everything out all the time. And then on top of that, you know, like if I want to hang out with friends, all my friends live in L.A. So it's like uh, I want to plan. I want to go out, you know, on Friday night or whatever. I always have to plan my night out and be like, oh, I guess I can't drink tonight because I have to drive back an hour you know, home where I have to figure out like who I'm going to stay with or something like that. So yeah. it's just so much more convenient being actually in the city. You know? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but obviously the price is the the main was the main issue initially. So okay, yeah. but that's not an issue now. Um, it's still an issue, it's still an issue <laughs> but it's not as much of an issue as it was. Okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> awesome. So I think last time you were still working uh, in the Brian Kennedy studio. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you are you still doing that? Are you still doing the same type of work there or? So I'm still working with the same people um, from this studio uh, for the most part, but um, the studio is not really um, operational in the same way that it was before. So I'm not working out of that studio anymore. Um, I'm at this point. I'm pretty much just kind of I'm doing home sessions and I'm kind of moving around to other studios in LA and Hollywood. Okay, so but, uh, the same the same crew pretty much. I still work with them. So. All right. So for those people who aren't as familiar with Brian Kennedy, he's like a super producer, right? And correct me if I'm what I'm saying is anything is wrong. He's produced like Rihanna and like mm -hmm. who else is who else has he produced and stuff? Um he's done Rihanna, he's done Chris Brown. So his 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 claim to fame I think is mostly Rihanna and Chris Brown stuff. Uh most people would know him from Forever uh by Chris Brown, uh Disturbia by Rihanna. He's okay. done some stuff for um Kelly Clarkson uh you know just various you know he did fantasia's comeback single recently um yeah super producer is a good way to describe him for sure yeah okay so yeah i mean you produce for rihanna you're, you're pretty much instantly a super producer <laughs> oh yeah 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 that that label cannot be removed from you once you produce for rihanna or chris brown it's just like instant yeah exactly so how did you get that opportunity remind us again for those who didn't catch that first interview because i'm sure a lot of people yeah. this may be the first introduction they've they've uh right. to to you We've, we've gotten we've gotten a lot bigger since then so yeah yeah <laughs> yeah uh first of all hi um i'm Aiden lewis uh so i first started working with brian when i moved down to um la about three years ago now um and uh i met i met i got linked with him through um a friend of mine curtis richardson and angelique sinaloo mm -hmm. who are two like some of my best friends and best co-writers and stuff um, that i've been working with for years now but yeah so i got linked to him through them um it's his studio that i was working out of and it was kind of it was really cool um because when i first moved down to la he uh you know he kind of took me in he listened to my stuff he was like you're, you're dope um you know if you ever need like a home studio just kind of like chill at and kind of you know make you feel like you have like a place in la you mm -hmm. know feel free to come here and just you know be be you which was the best thing you can hear when you're moving to a new place like LA for sure. You don't right. have anybody. So. so, so, so what does that, what does that exactly mean for, for those of us who don't know? Um, when you say like home studio or just like, is he saying like you can like get studio time for free or like you can like use the equipment um, or like what, what does that mean per se? 
I don't know if it means studio time for free. Um, I think it's more so just that um, feel free to like, you know, come here and just hang out and just feel like feel at home here. Like um, it's like like a base, basically, where you a studio where you can go and you can work on stuff and not feel like you're kind of like tiptoeing around and like walking on eggshells. Because a lot of times when you're in like a major studio, um, there's things that you, you, you feel sort of like confined because a lot of times you're reserving a time limit and you um, have to kind of abide by certain, you know, things you can only, you can't really go in certain areas, like, you gotcha. know, just like that. So it's just more so um, a place that you can come and feel comfortable, like feel welcome. Like everyone here is, you know, um, you know, they're nice. They're in your corner, that type of stuff. Right. Right. Okay. Excellent. So you moved, you moved to uh, LA proper now. Are you still working out of that same studio or you or no? Uh, no, not really. Um, the studio is not really operational in the same way that it used to be. Um, so I have just been kind of moving around to different studios in Hollywood, just kind of doing sessions at other, other studios. But uh, like I said, I still work with the same crew of people for the most part. Okay. And then what do you mean by like not operational in the same way? Um, I think he sold the property to someone. Um, I'm not sure what they're going to do with it, but I, okay. I, think he, I don't think he like owns the building anymore. So okay. that's what I mean by not operational. So like the people, they're all still doing music and stuff, but okay. I don't think that the actual place is still operational. Okay. Okay. As a, again. All right. Excellent. So you're still working with the same people. So, so that's good. You're able to continue that, that network and that process and that growth there. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. That's really important. Yeah. So are you still are you still writing for people? Are you still I mean, obviously you, you released some new songs recently, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. Um, yeah. So what, what has been what has been going on with with the other stuff, not just your stuff, but the the kind of the writing and the producing? I know you like to do a lot of that for other people as well. Yeah, um, that's been super hectic uh, the past year and a half or so. I've just pretty much been ramping up the production and writing for other people. Um, uh, I've been doing a lot of like DJ features and stuff like that recently um, within the past year. And then um, in addition to, you know, writing for other people, uh, I actually got a really big K-pop placement re recently, which mm -hmm. is, you know, pretty amazing. Um, so, yeah, you know, just trying to keep at it and get as much content out as I can for for other people. For sure. Trying to get my name out as much as, as possible and get people to to know that I'm you know a writer, producer. In right. the industry. Well, the, for those of us who know and follow you, you definitely have a, a pretty impressive resume. Uh, when Thank it, you. When it comes to you know who you've worked with before, can you can you go ahead and take us through some of the people that you've worked with, maybe recently or you know in the yeah. past? Because I know you've worked with some pretty big people. Mm -hmm. So, um, I my first big thing was with uh, Jason Chen, who's a big uh, YouTuber. Um, we, I think we're at, I don't even remember how many views the song is at now, but I did a song called Best Friend mm -hmm. with uh, Jason and uh, another uh, co-writer friend of mine, uh, producer named Smash Hitta. Um, and I think that's at like 19 million or something like, right, like that like right now. But um, that was the first big one. And then uh, from there, it kind of just snowballed into other things. Like I've worked with um, another Asian artist named Janine Weigel, who is amazing, amazing singer. Um, she's an amazing actress. She's like, she's only, I think she's like 16 now or something, 16 or 17 now. Um, wow. but she's phenomenal. Um, very popular in Thailand. Um, then in addition to that, you know, I worked with, uh, Brian Kennedy, Angelique Sinalu, Curtis Richardson. Um, Angelique has done some stuff on, uh, like with La La Land. She did a lot of stuff in that movie. Um, oh, wow. Curtis Richardson, Curtis Richardson, uh, is like my right hand guy at this point. Um, he's done... Like he's legend. He's done stuff for Rihanna, like Rihanna's first album. He's done stuff for Jennifer Lopez. Just you know, just wow, big people. Yeah. So there's Curtis. There's Brian Kennedy, obviously. Um, then last year I did some DJ features with some cool DJs. Uh, I did one called Safe House with an artist named Dr. Funk on uh, Hardwell's Revealed label, mm -hmm. which is really cool. I, I know. Um, I did. He's actually, yeah, he's actually one of my favorite EDM DJs. He probably is. My, yeah. 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 He's like top three for me. Yeah. Yeah. He's awesome. He's amazing. Yeah. He's super, super cool. Super supportive. He uh, really supported the record, which is really cool. It's called Safe House by Dr. Funk. Okay. Um, and then there was another one too. Another uh, couple records I did with uh, DJ Matt Way. 
and uh, Luca Testa, who are also like phenomenal DJs. Um, we shot a video for it in uh, Switzerland, which was really cool. And uh, oh, wow. it's doing really well. Yeah, it's cool. It's been getting played in. Uh, he Luca Testa actually just posted on his story today that it got it's getting played in like stadiums and stuff like soccer stadiums, which wow. is really dope. <laughs> yeah. So so, so yeah. what what did you do for that record with Luca Testa? Um, I uh, lended my vocals and I wrote the song. Okay. Co-wrote the song with Kurt. And what's and what's the name of that one again? Um, the one with Luca Testa and Matt Way is called Nothing Without You. Okay. And then there's another one with Matt Way um, called Closure. Okay. All right. Yeah. I'm, I'm writing these down because after this I'm gonna go listen to them. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll send you like a list of like the the main ones and stuff. Yeah, man. It seems it seems like every week or so you <laughs> you posting about some new thing you've been working on. And yeah, yeah. Cooking up. Yeah, and it's funny because like it you know I don't really. I don't plan it out that way. I feel like it just kind of, they kind of usually fall into each other most of the time. Right. You know, as you do things, uh, if you right. do stuff back to back, I guess the, the release schedule kind of, sometimes they just happen to line up really well. Right. Or not well at all. Sometimes you have multiple things coming out within the course of like a few days or something and it's kind of, kind of stressful, but yeah. You know, right. It's nice to have a constant inflow, constant uh, influx of music, I think, or content in this day and age. Absolutely, absolutely. So you you've been working with the EDM guys, you've mm -hmm. been, and now you've also been working with K-pop. Can you can yes. you delve into that a little bit? How how did that even come about? Because I think yeah. well before before I let you go, a lot of people and if you just search on YouTube, it's amazing to see like you see like Drake's videos. Yeah, they get a lot of plays and stuff like that. But you look at these artists from other countries and then see like wow they've got billions of views and it's just like wow where yeah. did that come from? And I know oh, yeah, spe sure. specifically like the South American market is huge for like, uh, you know, those South American tracks. And I'm just like amazed. Wow, they've got hundreds of millions of views and you've got a lot of mm -hmm. American artists who have like no views compared to them. So right, I'm, sure right, the same, exactly. I'm sure the same thing is true with like the K-pop artists. Um, yeah, well, that's the thing. I, I think a lot of people don't realize how popular um, – like certain pop music is in other countries. Like K-pop is extremely popular. For sure. Um, and so many Americans don't even know about it. Like we're, I think America is just now finally starting to come around to K-pop. Um, we had kind of a, a very, very small burst of K-pop like a few years ago when Psy went viral. Right. Uh, with Gangnam Style. Right. And I think, um, but I think, I don't think it stuck back then because Psy was more so of, like I think American audiences saw Psy as more of a, uh, like a comedic act in a way. Mm-hmm. Whereas um, and now I think we're starting to see an influx of um, more serious K-pop acts like BTS and EXO and, um, you know, Taemin and just, you know, different K-pop acts that are really, really, really pulling in numbers and real, like, real streams and, and purchases and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, but, um, yeah, go ahead. As far as uh, the K-pop placement that I got, um, I have to credit that a lot to Curtis Richardson, my co-writer and my A and R, and just you know my right hand man at this point. Like he he's really, really good with pitching stuff. Um, but that song came about. Uh, we initially did so the song is called Move. Um, it got cut by an artist named Temin, who is from the group Shiny, mm -hmm. really big uh, K-pop group. Um, we did that original demo for another artist initially, and uh, we we finished it. It sounded amazing. Um, and just as we were going to present it to the artist, we kind of held back on it because we were like, I'm not sure if this fits this artist really well, like exactly the way that we want it to. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes that happens. So um, we held on to the song. We didn't give it to the artist. We ended up giving the artist a different song, uh, which they loved. Uh, and we kind of held on to the song for the demo for about a year or so before it got picked up. Um, I think what happened was Curtis knew... Um, one of the ANRs who had just started working at SM Entertainment, which is a big uh, label in Korea, mm -hmm. and uh, he sent it to her. Um, they had it on they had it on hold for like almost a year before they did anything with it. So wow. Mm -hmm. So what? It was on hold for like two years since it was created, or did I do my? Math I think there? it was. I think it was about. I think it was about a year and maybe some change before um, since it was created before we started hearing anything about like any rumblings about it getting picked up. Okay. And initially, it was just sort of, it was just sort of like, oh, um, Temin from Shiny is interested, or their camp is interested in this song, um, and that was, it was just like that for like a few months. Like usually at this point, like I've gotten to the point where with uh, placements and stuff, I try to 
not get too excited until something actually actually happens right because um, in the music industry a lot of times like it's it can be all talk before you know nothing happens you're sitting there getting excited for something and it doesn't pan out so i try not to get my hopes up but in that case specifically because i'm such a k-pop fan k-pop fanboy i was like oh Taemin's not gonna take that like shiny's not <laughs> not gonna take that song like whatever i'm just gonna you know just let it let it pan out and it worked it happened so yeah so you so you were actually you actually knew of these artists beforehand, uh, Taman yeah. in particular, um, before they decide to select your music. Yes, um, I knew of Taman before because I was a fan of Shiny um, when I was younger, um, and I, I'm just a big K-pop fan just in general. So okay, uh, it was cool of me just to even know that the song is being pitched to a K-pop label, regardless of who was going to take it. Um, it was even better that Taman took it because you know I love Shiny so. Right. So do, do all these people like live in LA or, or in the area or? No. Um, so um, SM Entertainment is based in South Korea. So I've never actually met anybody from SM. I've never met Tim In. I've never met the A&R in person. Um, my A&R, uh, Curtis Richardson, is based in New Jersey, New York. Oh, wow. So I usually, yeah, so I usually sort of just uh, communicate with him over the phone and through text message and stuff like that. Um, I have met him in real life, obviously, but yeah. okay. Um, but yeah, I haven't met you know I haven't met any of the people from uh, the label yet. Hopefully, I will soon. But yeah. okay, so you have an A and R. So are you signed with a, a label now, or are you still like independent? Or because I know you had a, a writing deal, I think before, or you were. Yeah, no, um, no, I'm not signed to a label. I'm not signed to a publisher right now. Um, I'm in talks, especially now with the K-pop. Tame in placement. Um, it's gotten me. It's opened up a lot of doors. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm in talks with some, uh, specifically some labels and uh, some publishers in uh, Asia. Um, but I'm trying to focus my market mostly on international market at this point um, because I think uh, it feels a little bit more lucrative right now just because I kind of already have stuff going on right. overseas. That, that but I'm not currently signed. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So, so the music mm -hmm. you put out recently is, I mean, that's your stuff is completely independent all independent yeah okay 100 percent. excellent and so before we before we delve into that for those of us that don't understand the whole like placement thing and like that sounds like a lot of industry jargon can you can you yeah, yeah. <laughs> can you take us through the process of like how how that whole how the whole thing went down like so you so you wrote the song i'm assuming and then take what happens from there so um so we wrote the song, um, as I said, it was initially for another artist, um, but usually in those cases, uh, you would get what they call a pitch sheet or, um, yeah, like a pitch sheet. And they would basically, the pitch sheet basically tells you, it details what um, artists are looking for songs and then what type of songs they're looking for. Um, it'll usually have like a reference song, like, oh, we want something like, uh, like Drake God's Plan or something like that, you know? Uh -huh. And then... Um, It'll have a description of the artist, all that type of stuff, what type of music they're looking for. And then you kind of submit songs that are in the vein of what they're looking for. Um, so for Move, we did the song. Um, I don't think we specifically pitched it for anybody. I think we just sort of sent it out with a bunch of other songs that we had. Um, just kind of being like, hey, we have a bunch of songs here. If you can place them, place them. Right. Um, so from that point, I think, um, I think Korean labels work a little bit differently in that uh, than to American labels in that I think um, a lot of times if they like the song, they'll kind of hold on to it and try to find the right artist for it if they really, really believe in the song. Mm -hmm. As opposed to, I think, American labels generally, if the song doesn't fit who you're submitting it for, they're just like, uh, yeah, we'll pass. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, so we did the song. Um, Curtis submitted it to his A&R friend at SM. And then from that point, honestly, I don't really know too much of the goings on behind the scenes. Uh, I just know that it was about a year before we actually heard anything solid. And the first thing that we heard uh, back from the a &R was that they were interested in the song as one of the singles. Um, they didn't know if it was going to be the lead single or if it was going to be a follow-up or whatever, but they said that they were interested in it. And that was pretty much it. From that point, um, it was mostly just kind of back and forth. They were just telling us, oh, uh, I think they cut the record or they're recording videos for it now or just, you know, that type of stuff. They're doing choreography, blah, blah, blah. They mm -hmm. also did ask for changes to the beat and stuff like that as well. So, but that was the point where when they started asking for changes, that's the point where I knew that 
uh, it was actually serious uh, because they wouldn't really ask for changes if they weren't really going to okay. go for it. Right, right, right. That makes a lot of sense. All right. So, so thanks for detailing <clears throat> that, that little bit there. Um, yeah. And for anybody that doesn't know, a placement means uh, that an artist um, – this, or an artist management decided that they like the song and that they want to use it for their project. So that's a placement. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for defining that. Um, yeah. I'm sure, I know a lot of people are interested in probably doing some of what you're doing, the writing and the producing. A mm -hmm. lot of talented people uh, on the internet these days. It's crazy. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. For sure. It for is sure. crazy. It's, it's insane. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the I'm competition sure. Competition is so much higher <laughs> than it used to be. Right. So. Uh, any 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 way that people can you know get their foot in the door into the industry, whether it's like writing, producing. That's why I think your story is so interesting because you have so many different facets to your game that not a lot of other people have, or not a lot of right. other people even think about. Yeah, um, you know, uh, it's the the entertainment industry is so hard to really give advice on like getting your foot in the door mm -hmm. because I. Like even to this point uh, in my career, which is still really young, um, like there's still days where I feel like I'm not even in the industry. It's kind of weird. But like um, I was just having a conversation with one of my other friends, um, songwriter friends, and we were just kind of trying to figure out like what was the point where we knew like, oh, we're actually like in the industry, like we're actually professionals now. And honestly, I don't I don't really think there is a point. I think the point is where you decide the point is, mm -hmm. where you actually decide that you know you're a professional. Um, for me, I think it was when I came. Like at some point, like last year, I came home. Uh, I was still living in Palmdale, and I was I had made money on like a session, and you know I was feeling good about myself. The song was good. The people liked it, and I was like, you know what? Like I'm actually doing this professionally. Like I'm an actual songwriter. I'm an actual producer. Like I'm getting paid for it. Like I'm getting songs placed. Like people are picking up songs. You know mm -hmm. that type of stuff. So I think it's really it's whatever whatever the goalpost, wherever the goalpost is that you set. But I would say if you're trying to get your foot in the door, you know, get into the industry, just just write, just write and produce, just just do it. That's pretty much all I can say. Like do it for other people and uh, get to the point where people want to buy your stuff mm -hmm. or they want to buy a song from you and sing it themselves. I think the, at the first point when somebody starts buying music that you make for themselves to sing, or perform, I think that's when you know that you're a songwriter or that you're a producer. Okay. All right, that's that's something good to keep in mind. So for everyone who's listening out there, take take Aiden's advice. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I will say I will say um, because I know that some people will probably be like, oh, but how do you how do you reach out to artists? I would say um, don't like you know aim for the stars, but don't aim for the stars too quickly. Like don't try to reach out to. Rihanna's people or Rihanna's management because you're not going to get a response like reach out to other artists who are like on your level like people that you genuinely enjoy I think I said this last time too but people that whose music you genuinely enjoy um, but they're near your level or they're more they're closer to um, I guess your status level right so if you're a new producer reach out to somebody if you're a new producer with like a thousand followers on YouTube or Twitter or whatever or Instagram reach out to another artist who has maybe like somewhere between a thousand and like five thousand followers or something like that you know right and that's something you know you'll get a response from you. yeah exactly right. okay that makes a lot of sense um mm -hmm. yeah you you yeah i think i think that because also your skill level will probably be along the same lines too right exactly and even if your skill level is above um what you're currently reaching out to like even if your skill level is at rihanna level um it doesn't really matter unfortunately because Again, like Rihanna's people are not going to respond to you regardless of how talented you are. Yeah. If you don't, if you don't have a label or somebody like backing you to vouch for you, that's just how the industry works, unfortunately. But you know, you got to play the game. Or maybe if you're friends with Rihanna. Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> if you're friends with Rihanna or friends with Rihanna's friend or something like that, you know, you have some type of in. But if you don't have an in, then you got to do it the hard way, which is you know, working working your way up. Mm -hmm. Um, so now we're going to delve into like your personal, uh, songs that you like for you that you've written and produced as well. So, okay. uh, two singles, how to and signature. Those are your most mm -hmm. recent ones, right? You've released them we'll say, over the past couple weeks or so. Uh, yep. absolutely amazing. I love Thank you. them. Appreciate that. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about the project you're, you're coming up with or are, are you making, I think you are making a album, right? 
Right, yeah. I'm doing an EP. Okay. Um, it's mm-hmm. called Take Two. Uh, the reason it's called Take Two is because uh, it's full of songs that um, I've started in the past and just sort of never finished. Um, as a songwriter or producer, just any creative in general, I think uh, a lot of times we start things and then other things come along, life happens or whatever, or you get interested in other songs or other projects and uh, certain things just sort of fall by the wayside and you just don't really get around to finishing them. So uh, take two, the entire EP is full of just songs that I had started maybe like at some point in the past and Mm -hmm. just never really got around to finishing and I'm finishing them now or redoing them in some cases. So there's going to be a couple songs on the EP that um, longtime fans of mine may recognize, uh, but they're going to be like redone, new production, new vocals, all that stuff. Okay. Um, So how many songs are you expecting for the EP? Do you know yet? I don't know completely, but I think the cap is like seven. So at least at max, it'll be like seven. Yeah, because after that, it's like an album, right? It's like an album, <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> or a mixtape or something. But I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try to go all, as as much as I can. But um, for now, I'm just gonna be releasing single after single until uh, I just want to kind of drum up a little bit of interest and a little bit of momentum, and then I'll release the full EP okay. in the coming. Now, will you be shooting uh, music videos for those for those songs as well, or have you thought about that yet? Or are you just kind of going with the flow? Yeah, yeah. I, I honestly, I'm. I want to say that I'm going with the flow. I, I have spoken to people about music videos um, and just sort of visuals in general. Um, I, that's something that I would like to do uh, if it makes sense for the record. Um, if not, I don't want to put too much. I don't want to put too much effort into um, something if I know that it's not going to uh pan out you know um exactly the way that i want so i want to i just want to make sure that everything fits the way that it should if i'm going to do a visual for it but yes i do plan to i do plan to do uh visuals for the songs on the album for a few of them actually yeah i liked a lot some of your visuals in the past um where it's just like you like singing and like i guess yeah those are those are some of my favorite ones uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, the OG bedroom. Yeah, scene. man, because that 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 reminds me of the come up a little bit, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And yeah, um, there may be some of those as well. Yeah, um, we're just kind of just playing it by ear at this point, trying to see uh, what the interest is. Mm-hmm. But um, I have so many ideas, and the people that I'm working with have so many ideas. So yeah, you know, we'll just see where things take take us. Okay. Um, so then, one more question dealing with that is: Do you have a release date for your EP? Uh, no release date yet, um, but there will be singles. I'm trying to release one single, at least one or two singles per month. So there will be more singles in March. Um, there will be singles in April. And then I'm hoping by that point I can just kind of release the, the EP like at the top of summer. I think that would be like a good uh, goal. For sure. For sure. But yeah, but like Signature is out now. How To is out now. Um, I'm trying to you know promote those as much as possible. Like go listen to them. I think they're amazing, you know. I hope you think them are amazing. <laughs> For sure. We're definitely going to put the, put the links in the description here. Um, mm-hmm. and, who, and who knows? One could make an appearance on the channel. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, we'll talk about that a little bit after. Uh, but yeah, man, that, that's awesome. So seven, about seven. I'm not, you said it may be seven. So about seven uh, singles, seven songs there on the EP. And we'll look out for that around summertime, I guess. Yeah. Um, so anyone, inter- inter- anyone interesting that you're looking to work with either for the EP or like in the future in 2018? Oh uh, yeah. Oh, so many people. Um, it's a hard question actually. So for the EP, I think it's mostly going to be just me. Mm-hmm. Um, but for, I have so many, aside from the EP, I have so many songs already done and uh, ready to go for future projects, um, with other people, um, and just by myself. But I really, I really would love to expand my collaborative effort this year. Um, I so the people that I really want to work with right now, um, they're probably a little bit out of my range at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, but like as always, like John Bellion is one. Um, there's there's so many indie artists that I would love to work with. Don Richard is another one. Um, God, it's so hard to even think right now. But there there's there's tons there's tons and. Um, I'm always open to collaboration, so, uh, you know, if anybody's watching this that loves my music and you're dope, like, hit me up. My email's in my bio and stuff like that. But um, I think for me, though, collaboration is more uh, 
it's if it fits for the song, if it fits for the project, then mm-hmm. it's a go. I'm not the type of person to try to force a uh, feature onto a project if it doesn't make sense. Right. So have yeah. you ha- have you had situations where you thought it was a good idea in the beginning and then it doesn't end up working and then you're just like, uh, we should probably stop? Um, I think that happens a lot. But for me personally, I try not to, to do collaboration. Like I try to vet my collaborators uh, as much as possible before actually working with them because I know that it sucks to spend time doing something and then be told that uh, you're going to go in a different direction or something like that. So mm-hmm. I, 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 I never want to be in the position where I'm the one telling somebody, oh, we decided to go with something else or in another direction. Sorry, we can't use this. Mm-hmm. So usually if, I'm, usually if I say that I'm going to work with somebody, I usually follow through and try to make sure that, that um, it happens. Um, in most cases, um, you know, I, that's a different, it's a different case if I'm like, if we're just co-writing and we're not really doing something specifically for a release, mm-hmm. like if it's a co-write with another songwriter or producer and it doesn't really go that well, then, you know, it's no, no fault, no shame. Like we can just put the song into our catalog and shop it out to somebody, but yeah. Okay. Awesome. So speaking of recording, how are you, like, what equipment are you using? Like, how are you recording nowadays? Um, yeah, yeah you know, I'm still recording in my bedroom. <laughs> okay. Still recording in my bedroom, like all the time. Um, that's the main place that we're, that I record. Um, I have I've upgraded my mic since the last time I, we talked, I think. Um, okay. But I'm still not using anything super fancy. Like I'm using a um, a Blue Yeti Pro um, USB. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Like that's uh, the microphone uh, it you use. My computer. Yeah, Blue Yeti Pro. That's, that is that's crazy. That, yeah, it's insane. Like the vocal that you hear in Signature and How To, they're both recorded on a Blue Yeti. Wow. In my bed. Yeah. Holy cow. Wow. Yeah. And <laughs> to, uh, to any producers out there or songwriters to engineer yourself, like it's not about the equipment. Um, yes, the equipment definitely helps. Uh, having a studio space that's sound treated definitely helps. But um, it, honestly, it really isn't about the equipment. It's about um, you know, you're mixing and it's about like what you do with the equipment. Like if you can mix really well and you can really compress your vocals for producers and, you know, engineers, they know what I'm talking about, but, yeah. um, if you can mix really well, that's, that's the key, I think. Wow. I'm, I'm impressed, man. Cause that's a really attainable microphone for a lot of people. That's it not, is. It's like you said, it's not super fancy. Yeah. It's USB, mm-hmm. it's plug and play. Um, yep. I'm using a blue microphone right now recording this. Uh, yeah, the, the you blue. can you can go and record a song right now. <laughs> <laughs> that is crazy. I'm in yeah. shock. Wow. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, um, you know, I, I use much fancier equipment when I go to record at actual studios. But for the most part, like most, actually, I think to this day, all of the music that you've heard that's my own music, if it's released as Adian or Adian Lewis, mm-hmm. um, it's all been recorded on a USB mic at home. Wow. Mm-hmm. Okay. So is there any reason why you haven't um, gone to like, what's the other kind of microphone? Like, uh, like um, I mean, I could, or... yeah, personally, I would love to have a Neumann mic, um, but uh, it's a little bit out of my price range right now. But also, um, I just, I haven't felt like I really needed to upgrade at this point. Right. It's um, because people haven't really been complaining about the sound quality of my music. I mm-hmm. haven't really felt a need to upgrade. And then in addition to that, when I'm, like I said, when I go to other studios, um, I use higher quality stuff anyway, so it was. It's never been like a big issue for me. Mm-hmm. What the the equipment that I use. Okay. Wow. Mm-hmm. But I will say though, I will say though, if you can afford to have good equipment, you know, I'm not one to stop you. Like, go for it. Right. I think um, having better equipment makes it easier to get a better sound. So you know, if you can afford it and it makes sense for you, go for it. Okay. That's interesting. Um, but clearly, a lot of I guess you got to develop your craft and, you know, get good with like what, what software are you using? I'm still using Logic Pro. Um, I, for synths and stuff like that, I use uh, Serum mostly today. Um, and I still use mostly Waves plugins um, for mixing and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Wow. Like, yeah, it's nothing, nothing fancy, honestly. That's incredible. I think, again, it's more so about your, your skill level and like what you're doing with, the stuff that you're using, what you're doing with the plugins, what you're doing with the programs and stuff like that. If you know how to use them really well and you know how to be creative and you know how to um, make things sound good, then you don't need too much. 
Yeah, that's incredible. And I will say also too, I think um, I think starting out using uh, lower quality stuff is, um, in my experience, has been really helpful because you have to learn the equipment. You have to learn how to you have to learn how to um, work around uh, with compromise. So when you have like really really high quality stuff, it makes you. I feel I find that it sometimes it makes you a little bit lazy because you don't have to do as much to get a good quality sound. But if you're forced to work with uh, lower quality things, you kind of have to you have to compromise. You have to figure stuff out. You have to find workarounds and stuff. So you know, that's a that's a really good piece of advice because you know with like with like anything, there are people out there who go buy the the top of the line whatever whatever just because they can. But their skill level doesn't really, you know, match up to that. They're not really getting the most out of it as, right. they, as they should be. Right. It's like why why spend all this money on something so fancy and expensive and you know high quality when the stuff that you're doing with it is not high quality, you know, or when you don't really know how to use it. Right. You know, start with the small stuff, save your money, and then once you get a you know a better skill level and you know learn how to do things once you learn how to do more with less than you know upgrade yeah that man that's that's incredible advice that might be some of the best advice i've heard on this channel uh, <laughs> i'm not even joking that's incredible that's incredible yeah, um, yeah young producers young songwriters you know you know listen to that because like seriously like if you can do more with less like honestly it doesn't even you don't even have to think about it in terms of equipment just being able to do more with less is really useful in life honestly i think for sure for sure um so I, I guess piggybacking on that so someone might say okay but how do i get better like how, how does someone perfect their skills how do are there like tools out there that they can use like what are some ways that you know some real world tactical things that someone can do to get better um practice i guess this it's such a cliche answer, but it's it's really true. Like, uh, don't be afraid to skip out on a Friday night. You know, your friends are going out, and you want to stay home and work on music. Don't feel pressured to like, to you know, always be out and about and stuff like that. Um, you know, sometimes it's okay to stay home and just work on music and just you know vibe out. Mm -hmm. Honestly, like most of, I keep going back to the fact that I'm broke, but it's it has such a or that I have been broke and but it really had such a huge influence on, I think the way that my career path developed because um, being broke, I couldn't always go out on a Friday night. I couldn't really always drive. I couldn't always afford to like drive an hour mm -hmm. to LA to go hang out with friends or whatever. So I would just, you know, stay at home and do what I know best, which is making music or I would just vibe out. Maybe I'll, you know, drink something or, you know, smoke a little and just, you know, work on some music for a little bit. I think that's the best way to improve just, keep working and enjoying what you're doing. Um, and you'll just find that you eventually will improve. Yeah. It's just, it's just a natural thing that humans do. Like the more you do something, the better you get. And so to, and so to put this in perspective for those people who think that, you know, you can be a good musician or producer overnight or within a year, how long have you been making music? It's been about eight years or so now since I first started doing this like professionally um, even beyond that, like I've been doing music since I was in like grade school. So you have to, you have to take into consideration, like, you know, what your skill level is and you know, how often you're doing stuff and how, how often you're actually sitting down making music, but it's not an overnight thing. It's mm -hmm. never going to be overnight. Right. Um, but again, like it's based off of your skill level and how you are adapting to things. Like I have friends who, I have a friend who is an amazing producer. He just started producing like a year ago oh, and really? he's phenomenal. Yeah, I was like so jealous of the first time I heard like his music. I was like, how are you doing this within like a year? And, you know, it's just pe some people are just more naturally inclined to certain things than others. But, you know, don't let that ever discourage you. If you're not naturally inclined to something, you've got to do it more until you're better at it. That's just how it is. If that's something that you really want. Right. Right. So, like, how, how could someone be good at it? like so fast because there's a this seems like there's a lot of music part a lot of moving parts with like music production and i know i i did hear about one technology recently i forget where i heard it i think it might have been on the complex show blueprints where somebody was i don't know if you've ever seen that but basically like they bring on like like timbaland or like 
some like CEO of some brand or something and they go through like how they made it in their career. It's a pretty good show. It's on YouTube. Okay, that sounds really interesting, actually. Yeah, Timbaland was on it. And I think someone was talking about like some some program now that you can get, which basically turns any regular person into a music producer overnight. Um, but Do you remember what it's called? I don't. I'd have to I'd have to look it up and get back to you on that. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's send me a link to that. That's sounds amazing. <laughs> sounds amazing. It's it's new and it might not even be out yet. It might be like still in the works, but that's the mm -hmm. goal of it. Um, um, well, I do know that there are like there there's definitely plugins that help. Um, uh, I don't know if there's specifically a plugin or a program that's gonna uh, obviously make you like an amazing producer overnight. But um, there's definitely things that I have used to kind of facilitate my learning process or to kind of like sometimes I'll end up in an artist block or something like that and there's plugins or programs that I've used to kind of help me get out of it. Mm -hmm. um, one of those is uh, called Cthulhu. Um, I think it's spelled C C T H U L or something like that. I don't know. Cthulhu. Cthulhu. But um yeah, and it's uh I think it's by I can't I think it's I think it's by X for Records, but I'm, I can't remember the, the creator, but it's called Cthulhu. Mm -hmm. Um I'll send you a, a link to it. Um, and you can put it in description if you want. But um, basically what it is, is it's a chord trigger program. And what that means is uh, it makes it easy to play different chords um, with only one key on uh, your keyboard, as opposed to like when you're when you're playing chords naturally, like you're going to be playing it with like multiple fingers and right. stuff like that across, you know, the entire keyboard, but this program, but uh, chord trigger programs basically they come pre-installed with different chords, um, and they're programmed to specific keys on the keyboard. Mm -hmm. So you can press one key and it'll play an entire chord. You can press another key and it'll play an entire chord. So it's cool. I've been using um, I've used that for like the past almost year, just when I'm stuck in a rut and I can't think of anything. Mm -hmm. It's help. It helps because it kind of gives me a different. Um, it helps me to think in a way that I probably wouldn't naturally think. Right. If I'm going to sit down at a keyboard or at a guitar and like play a chord, generally you would go to um, a chord that you're familiar with. But with a chord trigger program, you can eliminate the monotony of what you would normally do. Right. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Um, artist block. Does that does that come around often? I mean, I guess you write and produce a lot, and for other people and. You probably don't want to like comes, mix sounds and stuff like that. Yeah, it definitely comes around a lot more often these days than it used to. Yeah. <laughs> but I think um, I think that's a, that was a result of me just doing more. Um, you know, the more you do, the harder it gets to kind of think of original things to mm -hmm, do. Mm -hmm. And I'm the type of I'm the type of producer um, that I try not to I try not to produce beats that sound too similar to each other like i try to be conscious of when i'm producing not to produce something that sounds like stuff that i've already done um i think naturally um everyone has a style uh like even if you don't know what your style is you definitely have a style um and you just don't recognize it um but i think naturally people tend like creatives tend to do stuff um in their own style just naturally so um a lot of times if i'm in a session with somebody i'll try to make sure that my production doesn't sound exactly like the production that I did yesterday or the day before. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem with that is that it can kind of be, it can kind of take a toll on like your, the creative side of your brain. So I find a lot of times I'll have to take like a week off and just kind of let my brain refuel itself and recharge. I got it. The ideas and stuff like that. Got it. Okay. That's cool. So uh, wrapping up here, I just got a few more questions for you. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see how we've been on here. What? Dang, forty-five minutes. That's crazy. Hey. <laughs> uh, uh, Always good chat. Yeah, man. It's been it's been a long time, so we got a lot of stuff to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, who do you who do you listen to as far as artists? Like, who are you listening to these days? Is it is it is it changed over the past couple of years? Are you still listening um, to like, the same people? It's definitely changed um, a little bit, but I I haven't stopped listening to anybody that I've been listening to. Um, it's just been adding people. Um, right now, I'm I'm still obviously listening to my main people like John Bellion and whatnot. Sia. Um, I have been really into the neighborhoods new stuff. Um, I love them. 
the neighborhood. Yes. I yes. Love Virtual them. high five. Yes. <laughs> I love them. <laughs> They're amazing. I love them. Um, I've loved everything they've done since their album with Sweater Weather on it. Yeah, that's how uh, I got introduced to them. Yeah, exactly. That song's amazing. That album was phenomenal. Absolutely. And um, I don't know if you heard, but they're releasing a new album soon. Um, it's very 80s inspired, which is really cool. The song sounds super dope. Um, so I've been listening a lot to them. Um, I don't know if you know uh, of Gala Matias and yeah. Alina Boaz, but yeah, he's super dope. And Alina, she's got a phenomenal voice. I've been listening to her EP a lot. And I think Gala Matias is like gearing up to release some new stuff mm -hmm. soon. So that's exciting to me. Um, who else? Let me see. Let me go through my my uh, recent listen. Yeah. Oh, the Black Panther soundtrack has been really dope. Oh, it's been, been great. Yeah, that's been a really really good soundtrack. Um, you know who whose album surprised me recently? Uh, Camila Cabello. Oh, I was the, Hava the Havana. The yeah, Havana. Nah, nah, yeah. Um, girl from Fifth Harmony. She's her album surprised me. I wasn't actually expecting to like it, uh, but it. I've been listening to it nonstop. Uh -huh. um, and then who else? Bazzy. Um, he has that song out now called uh, Mine. It's like mine. Hands on your body. I don't want to waste your time. No, I haven't heard it. I've got anyway, to be honest song, with but... you. <laughs> I stay. I pretty much stay in the underground, man. <laughs> that that's where I live. <laughs> So once once people you. get too famous, man, I can't listen to you anymore. Um. I feel you. <laughs> Bazzi's been underground for a while, and um, this song is his. I think his like breakout song at this at the at the moment. Like it was put on. Like I guess Taylor Swift did like a like a playlist of like songs I'm listening to, and Bazzi was on there and uh, stuff. So he's kind of blowing up right now. It's a good but place um, to be. he's really dope. Yeah, he's actually um, fun, funny. He's actually another one of the songwriters that was on the Tamin Move album. He did another song on that album. So oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. So are you guys going to collaborate in the future again? Um, it would be cool. I would love to collaborate with Bazzi. You know, uh -huh. Hopefully we can make something happen. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. That's so awesome. that's you know, so a, a few of the things. I'm a huge too. fan of the neighborhood. It's it's actually funny. Um, yes. I So back when we had our last uh, Skype call, we I was living in St. Louis at the time. And every year they have a event for july 4th like it's free to the public and they have like big artists like that year the fray was headlining and it's oh, like right, free yeah. um mm -hmm. but one of the other groups was uh the neighborhood they were performing live and it's like free and it's funny because this is like a you know like a wholesome like family environment and they were just like cursing a bunch on stage <laughs> <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> but man, they're they're that awesome. That sounds amazing. Though. I would love to go to a free the neighborhood concert. That sounds awesome. Yeah, and they have huge bands like The Fray was there, and they had other ones too. I can't remember them, but yeah, I remember that. Was well, this a festival? It's called a uh, Fair St. Louis, and they do it okay. every year for July Fourth. And they oh, they, sweet. they have a bunch of people too. Like I think they had Anthony Hamilton. Like they literally have music like all day long. So mm -hmm. you're gonna get some good acts cool. in there. For sure. You know, that's something I've been wanting to do a lot more lately is um, festivals. Yeah. I've been trying to, get, to go to more shows, and I think festivals are one of those things that I really want to get more into. Uh -huh. Just the vibe and everything. Like, I used to really be big into, uh, like, raves and stuff like that when I was in college. But uh -huh. I think festivals are more so, like, the, the chill the chill adult version of that. Yeah. So, like, Coachella, you didn't go this year? I didn't go to Coachella. Um I really want to go to Coachella soon, um, maybe next year. But yeah, or I guess, um, I've I guess this only year, heard twenty eighteen, <laughs> or yeah, the coming year. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I've only ever heard amazing things about Coachella, and their lineup is always insane. Of so. course, of course. Um, and there, there's some other festivals out there as well, right? I mean, that's probably like the biggest one, but I know there's some other ones, right? Yeah, is, is um, Rolling Loud out there? Yeah, um, I think so. Um, there's one called Outside Lands that I've been wanting to go to. Um, for a while as well mm -hmm. um yeah uh, a bunch of there's a bunch of different ones yeah uh, i actually went to one um with some of my friends recently i can't can't remember the name of it but uh it was like an asian uh like it was mostly highlighting like asian artists and stuff like that which was really cool mm -hmm. um, i think stuff like that is really cool especially for underrepresented uh communities like that for sure for mm -hmm. sure that's awesome man so mm -hmm. Here's one of my questions, and I've actually I actually stole this from someone else. 
uh, Gary V. I don't know if I don't know if you know who Gary V. is. Um, no. But one of the questions he always asks, and I love this question, is what are you obsessed with right now? It could be anything I'm from like with. it could be anything from like these new oatmeal co- uh, raisin cookies that you found at the cookie shop <laughs> around the corner, or you know what, anything like that. Huh? What am I obsessed with? That's a good question. Um. Oh, you know what I'm obsessed with right now? I've been so I've been I need my like downtime a lot, so I've been playing video games a lot more recently. Mm-hmm. Um I love my PS4 to death. Uh I've been playing um this game called Horizon Zero Dawn, uh which is a it's a first player first person game, but um or first one player game, but mm-hmm. uh it's uh in a nutshell it's about this um this tribe of you know, just tribe, I guess, but it's it's in the future, like far, far, far in the future, like mm-hmm. after, like after our like um, era of humans are long gone, mm-hmm. um, and people are living in like this dystopian era where these machine dinosaurs are kind of monsters are kind of like roaming the land, and they uh, they're like corrupted and stuff like that. But it focuses on um, a girl who's part of this tribe, and she's been exiled mm-hmm. um, so she gets treated differently from all the other people in the tribe and basically she's basically the savior of um the dystopian world and you're kind of going around trying to uncover the secrets of you know the past and why these machines are the way that they are and why they're corrupted and you know why they even exist that type of stuff but mm-hmm. it's really dope it's an amazing game it's um it's pretty much open world um similar to i don't know if you played like uncharted or something yep, like that I have it kind that of game. follows yeah it follows a very similar like structure and kind of like vibe to uncharted i got you yeah okay that sounds that sounds awesome man um yeah that's funny i'm i'm not i go through phases too when i'm like into video games versus when i'm not into video yeah, yeah. games so yeah where you like kind of stop after a little bit and you get a little you know a little tired or jaded from it and then you just come back to it yeah you know? yeah so i'm in my i'm in my like obsessed with video games phase right now. <laughs> i got it i got <laughs> yeah. it um so what are you obsessed with? I would love to know what you're obsessed with. Sure. All right, this is this might be a little weird, but so a while ago, have you ever heard of Halo Top ice cream? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so my favorite flavor is the oatmeal cookie flavor. And Ooh. yeah, so r- recently I've been obsessed with like the steel cut like rolled oats, like the just the standard like Quaker oats. And I found this recipe on Pinterest for these like cookie balls. It's like it's like the rolled oats, like a little bit of honey, a little bit of vanilla. You put some like raisins. Cookie balls? Yeah. What are what are cookie balls? Like it's just a cookie, but like in a like sphere? No, it's basically like you mix a bunch of ingredients together and then you like pound them together into like a ball. So I'm, I'm about okay. to tell you. It's like peanut butter, like like the, the oats and like maybe a little salt, a little vanilla, a little raisin action. Mm-hmm. And that sounds amazing. It, is, it tastes just like a regular cookie, man. And it's like healthy because it's like all like raw ingredients. Um, uh, I love that. Yeah, found it on Pinterest. So I'm absolutely obsessed with that, and I've been like eating them like nonstop. So. Well, who's it by Halo Top? No, so I got obsessed. Just like Halo Top. No, okay, it's not ice cream. It's like a cookie, but okay. the Halo Top had the oatmeal cookie ice cream flavor. Okay. So, so I got obsessed with that flavor of like the oats because it actually has oats in the ice cream. Okay. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. So. That's what I've been obsessed with lately. Oh, that oh, sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> with oatmeal cookies. Yeah, man, you should check it out. Pinterest, man, I, if if my recipe isn't on Pinterest, then it's not a recipe to me because I don't, that's what I use Pinterest for. <laughs> for sure, for sure. I've been using, I've actually found myself using Pinterest a lot more recently too. I don't know, I don't think it's, it's not because I've been specifically seeking out Pinterest things. I think it's that I'm like Googling like recipes and stuff like that. And yeah. Pinterest, like a Pinterest result is usually the first one to come up. Pinterest. I think if somebody has already, you know, been in my mind and thought the exact same thing as me. I'm like, hey, here it is. Pinterest, <laughs> it. Pinterest is killing the recipe game. Like they should come out with a cookbook. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. You know what else I used Pinterest for recently? Um, so Halloween last year, I, uh, I went dressed as Tina for, from Bob's Burgers, and uh, uh-huh. I used Pinterest to figure out how to sew a skirt together <laughs> to uh-huh. do the tea <laughs> yeah. How'd that go? Did it go well? It went really well. I have to send you a picture of it. It's, it's, it was awesome. It's it not on my Instagram? Favorite, favorite Halloween costume. I don't think I, I saw it on Instagram. Uh, 
I didn't put it on my actual Instagram page, but I put it on my stories, I think, um, during Halloween. But I'll send you the picture. It's 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 uh, my favorite Halloween costume there. But. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Hall- Halloween's awesome if you get into it. Oh, yeah, for sure. I'm trying to get more into it now. Like, in the past, I just procrastinated too much. Most of the time, I want to go as, like, something really elaborate, and then it'll come down to, like, a week before, and I'll just be like, oh, I'm out of time. Mm-hmm. So. Okay. So, last question. In the last interview, I asked you the reverse of this question. So the last interview, I asked you to give some advice to artists. And I think you did a lot of that in this interview, some great tips and stuff like that. And then you gave a whole spiel last time as well. But this time, I'm going to flip it on its head and say, what's the best advice that you've received? Um, you know, I had a... I had a talk with a really uh, deep heart to heart talk with um, my friend Curtis Richardson, who I, I talked about earlier. Right. Um, this was just actually like probably like a month ago where I was just kind of being I was just really doom and gloom about just a lot of stuff that was happening at the time. And like just like, you know, sometimes when you're, you know, you're living life, things just happen and you just you just feel like everything's like falling like all at once, like the walls are crumbling around you, that type of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just had a really deep heart to heart with him. And he was just saying like, you know, like sometimes a lot of this stuff, most of the time this stuff happens because it's it's happening to make you stronger. And, um, you know, when bad things happen all at once, it's, a you know, it's sometimes it, you can see it as a test to make your, you know, your personality or your core stronger, you know, like if, if it seems like everything's, falling in around you you know you have to put up a shield you know mm-hmm. get out of the way don't just stand there and let everything don't just stand there and let the walls and walls crumble in around you mm-hmm. you have to move okay you have to do something to make it work and i think i guess that was the core of the advice is that you know when shit is happening and when things are going wrong don't just sit there and let it happen you have to you have like it's okay to be upset about it, but then you have to get up and you have to do something about it. You can't just let, sit there and expect things to get better or just let more shit happen. You know. Mm-hmm. Great, so I would say advice. that's that's some of the best advice that I've gotten because I think it it really changed my mindset about a lot of things and uh, it changed my whole mindset around like the way that I look at my own career, my own music, and stuff like that. So. I would say like, and I think, I think everybody goes through something like that where, you know, it's, it's obviously not always the same for everyone, but everybody has things in their life that suck and everybody has difficulties in their life, but it's the way that you handle them and the way that you come out of those difficulties that defines you. Mm -hmm. Great, great advice there. So I appreciate that. And that was indir- indirectly you gave a lot of advice during that one too. So <laughs> that's good. That's good. <laughs> um, yeah. So where can people find you? Um, people can find me on every major social media platform uh, under AD and Lewis. Um, I am now releasing my stuff as ADN, just the letters ADN. Okay. Um, so on Spotify and Apple Music and. Uh, Google Play, Amazon, all those title. You can find me under ADN, just the letters ADN. Mm-hmm. Um, my song is called How To and Signature. Signature is not out on Spotify or streaming just yet, but it will be soon. And it's um, on How SoundCloud. To is out there. Yeah, it's on SoundCloud. Um, everything's on SoundCloud. I always put everything on my SoundCloud. So worst case scenario, if you can't find a song of mine, it's probably on my SoundCloud. Um, but yeah, ADN Lewis on Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook. ADN on Spotify, iTunes, Apple Music, you know, all that. Well, thank you so you much. Too. Thank you so much for coming on, Aiden. Obviously, of course. Obviously, we'll have all those links in the description as well. And that other C- Cthulhu or whatever. Cthulhu, yeah. Cthulhu. Yeah. Don't, don't let me forget to send you the link to that. Yeah. That's a really good one, I think, for people. All right. For sure. For sure. But it's always, it's always awesome talking to you, dude. Like, I always enjoy our conversations they're always so deep and you ask the best questions so no problem man so thank you so much for coming on of course